because I was living all almost all my life in Singapore in Bukit Timah area, okay. which is far from Gelang Serai and so on. But later on, after I have uh, I've come up to Malaysia and then kicked out from Malaysia and banished to Singapore again, then I wanted to start a new life, so to speak, in Singapore. You know, having been here for some years and uh, working still in to some life at that time, I was still able to go back and forth, you know, Singapore, Malaya, Singapore, Malaya, until the the Utusan strike that uh, was launched by the workers in Utusan. And with that, my position had become very uh, difficult in the sense that I have to choose. I have been warned by them. You either stop doing it or you will be kicked out back to Singapore. But this is just something, the choice that I have to make at that time. So somehow or other, Utusan Melayu launched the Utusan strike in 19... 61. And um, from that moment onward, they took me as a person who should not be allowed to stay in Malaysia or to be in Malaya, Malaysia. And Tengku Abdul Rahman <coughs> made sure that I, when I was in Singapore, prevented me to come, from coming back and banished me to Singapore and this allowed me to come back to Malaya for many years. I think I came back to Malaya only about 25, 26, 7 years later when Mahathir became the Prime Minister. I uh, actually not new is it? Because it has been there for a long time. But whether or not Singaporean uh, showing interest, he wanted to know more and uh, to try to organize themselves into a kind of, you know, NGOs or other type of organization whereby you can discuss this matter further. Because this matter had to be brought up to the, to, 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 to among yourself and discuss among yourself to find ways and means how you can address them. You see, as far as the government is concerned, of course, we all know that PAP government has always been like that. If at all, if at all, I think they are more oppressive now. Because in order to continue to be in power, to control Singapore as they have been doing all this while, they need to be more, more oppressive. Because there is no way of allowing people to be free. I mean, if you start organizing something, before you have done something to act on what you have decided, they have already taken the, the action against you all. And this method has been their way of doing things ever since our days before. You see, the PAP government was such that, you see, originally the PAP government was supported by our people also. But well, later on, when they came into power, Lee Kuan Yew has took the initiative himself to be the stooge of the British imperialism and American imperialism and to act on their behalf. In other words, you see, they allow Singaporeans to be exploited continuously while pretending to be the leaders in Singapore. That is why you can see today that the PAP government cannot do anything because basically they are supporting the exploitive power in Singapore. And this they hope to continue so long as Singapore and themselves have not shown, uh, uh, has not taken initiative to oppose them. But it is easier said than done. You know, everybody wants to oppose it. You feel that you are not being fairly treated, you want to oppose it. But in order to oppose this, many ideas, people have many ideas to do it. But once you try to organize 
then you will begin to meet the opposition from the power that be. And perhaps this is the main problem. Now. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you talk in this way so that I, I can, I see a clearer picture of what's happening in Singapore. But me, uh, an old Singaporean in Malaysia, uh, not in good health, tried to do something but not been able to, uh, nevertheless feel that you all still have uh, ways and means to do something about it. Maybe not in a very big way, but in a small way, beginning with small group of um, organization whereby to create more consciousness. What you have been saying just now and uh, you, you, what you have explained was, you see, there is a consciousness among Singaporeans. But the only what is, I think, what is lacking is how to organize yourself so that good ideas can be implemented. Once you have organized yourself into group, into organization, like NGOs, or even through the trade unions and whatever they are still around, I think slowly this thing can be done. The only problem might be uh, the control over this organization, the control over the trade unions and other NGOs like has been destroyed completely with the launching of the Operation Cold Store on the 2nd of February 1963. That was the end of a little bit of democracy that Singapore have you know, been enjoying, and they, in one stroke of wind, then they destroyed the whole uh, system, the whole uh, grants that have been given to these people. You know, where we had the, uh, the student unions, was very active at the years, the uh, workers' union, the party, political parties, uh, still have some semblance of democracy upon which they could act. But all this has been destroyed with the launching of Operation Cold Storm. If you go, go, back, you go back to history, you look at the reason why they launched the Operation Cold Storm. You see, Lee Kuan Yew had been working with the, with the British, with British and American imperialist all the time. He had never been, as he said, as a leader of the Singaporean. But unfortunately, we also made mistake in supporting him, thinking that he could be the person who could lead Singaporean and eventually even Malaya, Malaya and so on. But nevertheless, you're looking at it, looking at the issue now, uh, we, I, I think Singaporeans shouldn't lose hope. You can still continue to hope that something can still be done, can st happen. And the only thing is that you need some kind of determination. You see, this is not a matter of uh, just wanting to be, to have some semblance of democracy. Democracy is already dead. Actually, it was uh, destroyed with the launching of Operation Cold Store. Since then, there has never been any new group of people who dare to come out and do something about it. There again, as I've said, it is maybe easier for us to say, why not, why don't you start now? Why don't you carry on win? face all the difficulties and the trouble, but this involves sacrifices. This kind of sacrifices that many people are beginning to feel less and less willing to make for this kind of purposes. For some, of, some reason or for some reason, Singapore appears to be quite affluent. 
people appear to be quite rich and the people are doing well and you don't hear of poor people around although among the the latest immigrants do find it but I think this is part of Lee Kuan Yew's old policy also he purposely brought in Chinese from China in such a great number to create more problem for Singapore whereas he could have done it he could have not instead of bringing them into Singapore, Singapore to build up Singapore based on Singaporean themselves but uh, as I said again uh, I have not been in close distance in Singapore's matter so you know with age coming up and so on with not a good health I am sad to know uh, that uh, there are still people in Singapore who wanted to fight but cannot fight and uh, they make sure that when you want to start they will stop it they will intimidate you in many many ways so but still maybe you can um, keep on talking about it get right to the bottom of Singaporean go to the people never mind about the leaders never mind about the big union and so on I go to the grassroots people go to them and work with them and bring a better consciousness among them and I think eventually one day I hope if this will happen I say it was abolished in Malaysia too I say still exists in Singapore in spite of the fact that the AP government thinks that they are very strong they still need the ISA because ISA was used to frighten the people even if you don't use it the very fact that people know that ISA exists was enough to make people run away from it you see as uh, I, I, having had the experience of being an ISA detainee myself once you are caught into the ISA uh, detention they want they as if they have already thrown you out of the country you are not known anymore people don't care for you In those days our days there are there were still people who fight for it the same ISA law is still existing because that is the only way they can frighten you they intimidate the people of Singapore but as I have said, what else can you do? You don't have opposition parties in Singapore who would want to fight over this matter. Even if there are opposition parties, they don't regard this struggle for freedom in this sense. With the existence, with the, with the existence of the ISA, even freedom of the press become meaningless. There is no meaning to freedom of the press if ISA is still there. Because the government can always use ISA just to detain you for whatever reason they want to detain you. And uh, well, coming back again, the, the, the issue is uh, in Singapore, you know what is not good for you. You want to change, but you are not allowed to organize yourself. Well, that, of course, they don't go around and say, hey, you don't organize this, don't do that. But it is enough to frighten you, to drive you away from this by keeping the ISA alive. With the ISA, you can, they can do anything for you and you cannot question. Once you are taken in, detained under the ISA, they shut your mouth and not only yours but the others who are free also will not be allowed to say anything to oppose it that was the the what you call the the nature of the internet security act but in singapore the, the earlier days they don't have internet security act 
they have what they call the preservation of public PPSO. And later on they changed it to ISA also. So you see with this ISA, uh, ISA was used as the, the biggest weapon by them, by the Kuan Yu, in collaboration with reactionary forces in Malaysia, when the Kupdaraman was around, to suppress the people of Singapore and Malaya by using the ISA. So you can see the, the nature of the ISA. Now if Malaysia abolish ISA today and Singapore still keeps it, it can only mean that the PAP wanted to continue using the ISA to intimidate the people of Singapore. When you know that there is an ISA, you will not want to do anything. Because ISA can be used at any time on anybody at their own fancies, you know. So the question will be, what is to be done? What are you going to do about it? The ISA is there. You cannot fight against it. You cannot say you, you, you don't want it. They say, okay, it doesn't matter, you don't want it. But when they think they want to keep you in, they are just the ISA. That was enough to intimidate, to frighten the people from doing anything against the government. I look for Jinping himself <coughs> to find out why. What have you been doing? What is it that you really wanted? I think you all know that I met Jinping purposely looking for him, and asking him, and even criticize him for what happened in Singapore during those years. But Jinping, I think he's still alive now, isn't he? Uh, and the last time I saw him about four or five years ago in, in, in Bangkok, in Thailand, Jinping himself said, they have the Malayan Communist Party. All the leaders, the Malay leaders in the Malayan Communist Party fought in the name of Malayan Communist Party. But whether or not these people were ideologically it's different from being a member of the party and being ideologically communist. The people that I met, I think it was published in the paper, from Rashid Maitin right down to Abu Saman Kazim, they were all inside the movement, inside the party, but ideologically they were not communists. And this was proved later and they themselves showed that they were not ideologically communist by going to Mecca to perform the arts. I mean, this is the difference, you know. The British and American imperialism have been forcing, have been blaming, or rather have been branding these people as communists, only because they fought against the British colonialism only because they took up arms to fight again. I took the trouble to look for these people. I met them, I talked to them. They admitted that they were Communist Party members, but ideologically it was a different matter. When ideologically you are not communist, it doesn't matter whether you are a member of Malayan Communist Party or a member of Abnum. You see, that, 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 that is the essence of the matter. I was fortunate enough, well, to be able to bring them together, bring them out of the jungle. We gathered in Bangkok, in Thailand, and then make them to declare what really are they fighting for. In truth, 
in my opinion also, they were fighting for an independent democratic Malaya, including Singapore. There was no such thing like communist Malaya. This were, these were all British and American imperialist trick to frighten the people from supporting the MCP. And when I was with Jinping, I mentioned to him, what do you, what do you really need for from, from Malaya? He's still alive today, you know? And Jinping said, we want to fight for a democratic Malaya, including Singapore. And he said that <coughs> that's also what I fought for. I said, yes. So we, we, in this sense, the British and American imperialism have been using the MCP's name to f intimidate the people, to frighten the people, so that they can come out to say that once you are MCP, you are in under the ISA. Well, anyway, the, the advantage of all what happened is that, and later on we came to know, when those people who fought, who took up arms against the British, came out themselves and declared. And I think they have written books also. Eh? All of them have written books. They have written their own experiences in the jungle. Abdullah Sidi had written one also. I met them all. In fact, I got Abdullah Sidi. I discussed with Abdullah Sidi. Abdullah Sidi was very frank, uh, you know, to say, yes, he took up arms, they took up arms, they fought against the British. They were not fighting against Malaya normally. So this is the, the fortunate thing that we have today is that we still have the chance to expose the British colonialism and American imperialism in this part of the world by using the Communist Party to brand us as government. Well, people like Samad Ismail, uh, of course, they were all journalists like me. In fact, uh, we were together from Singapore and then later in Malaya. And our struggle in that days was uh, to fight for press freedom by using our union or association of journalists and organizations connected with journalists and writers in Singapore and Malaya. Those people, like Saman Ismail, you mentioned Saman Ismail, Hussein Jahideen, yes, they were all my friends. We were all in the same uh, newspaper. We fought for freedom of the press. We demanded free uh, uh, freedom to write and freedom to express our views and freedom to oppose the exploitation of British colonialism and American imperialism. You see, at that time, the situation was different from what it is today. So you, you have to go back to that kind of situation whereby, in order, or rather, in order to understand why, the struggle for freedom of the press, even at that time, was so uh, intense. Many people were arrested because of that. Quietly, in this case. I had, Saman Ismail was my colleague in the Uttasan. He was arrested, he was detained, he was banished to the island and then later on he came back to join the straight sign. And I was with him in Uttasan when he was banished to Singapore, to Indonesia for a while. And then I continued with Uttasan life and then launched a strike of Uttasan to fight for freedom of the press, to fight for freedom for people to write. 
But they did, they did, they, that was the nature of struggle of journalists at that time. But as you must have known about what happened to people like Saman Ismail, like Hussein Jahidin, I think Hussein Jahidin is still alive today, I think, in Singapore. Saman Ismail passed away, and I, I think that generation was with me those years. I think I'm the only one left now. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Maybe there are a few others, but I have not known that if they are still around. Nevertheless, to mention about the struggle at that time, you can only see the only people in this group, in this uh, journalist group, that really shown their uh, opposition to the government you know, uh, to suppress freedom of the press. And today, of course, people don't fight for freedom of the press. People don't see that freedom of the press is of any, in any danger, because they have controlled the newspapers already. Under the ISA, nobody dares to criticize. If you are an editor of a newspaper, you will not write to criticize the government. And once you do that, you know what will happen. And that was enough to frighten, to intimidate. But nevertheless, some people may not be afraid of that. Then you face the consequences. But Linda Chen was one of the women leaders in Singapore at that time. Linda Chen was, uh, I think, lecturer in Nanyang University. And she was also student of the Milan University those years. And uh, I happened to be close with Linda Chen whose husband was a doctor, Dr. Singhwat, Tan Singhwat. Well, Linda Chen was a prominent women leader, leftist leader in Singapore, who fought together with us for freedom and democracy. And eventually, oh my God, uh, we also lost contact. I think she was left in Singapore, and I was up here. Oh, that I was detained. Linda Chen was also detained for a while. But since I was detained for too long, you know, by the time I come out, all these people have already been in all sorts of other organizations. But Linda Chen was still, I think, around and uh, led the women's group of the Parisian Socialists, I think, in Singapore. And uh, I think the last time I was with Linda was just prior to Operation Cold Storm. I was so Close to Linda and her husband, Dr. Tan Seng Huat. Uh, we, we met many times, we discussed many times. Ignoring the special branch, tracing us, and, uh, you know, things like that. Eventually, Linda was arrested. And I was arrested. By then, that was under Operation Coast Storm. That was the last time, you know, our relationship was cut off. After that, uh, after my release, I don't know whether I met Linda or not. It was so long, 17 years in detention, and you come out with your friends all over the places. <laughs> Where do we can do it?
you see, well, with Indonesia, uh, people like me, journalists like me in Singapore, Malaya, have been closely uh, associated with journalists in Indonesia. I led the Singapore Journalists Association, Singapore Journalists Union, Malaysia, Malaya and Malay, the Union, and so on and so forth. And therefore, my connection with them was uh, was very uh, very frequent. You know, we visit each other either in Jakarta or in. Now, the only reason why our association with the Indonesian journalists was so close is because Indonesia was. When Indonesia fought for her independence, journalists in Indonesia played a very important role. Mm -hmm. You must have heard name of Adam Malik, mm -hmm. uh, Naibahu of the PKI, and people like that. And they were all active, mostly they are all journalists. Rahman Hashim was the editor of Bintang Timu. Mm -hmm. He was leftist newspaper editor which was we were very closely connected with me. I purposely make a uh, uh, close association with Indonesian journalists because we were fighting for independence, supporting Indonesian struggle for independence, even before Malaya become uh, an independent state. So in this sense, my struggle for Freedom of the press actually started very early, in 1950s and 60s. Uh, I already started with that those things. And Indonesia was, of course, the place where we look up to at that time. You know, in Indonesia, the, they fought for independence. They took up arms. They launched uh, revolution in 1949-50, and all this inspired us in Malaya and Singapore. Personally, I was very inspired by their struggle and got involved in so many things. And of course, when you are in that kind of situation, I don't blame the special branch if they have interest in <laughs> you know, to make sure that I don't continue doing it. Why not? Who are you to stop me from doing it? So the only way to stop me is to put me in jail. And not just for one or two years. For 17 years, unfortunately. That, you know, the, uh, roughly the situation at that time.